Hello and welcome to another Tech Campus Coffee Live webinar. This is an opportunity for you to learn about career paths that tech directly from professionals in your field. We'll be speaking to technical representatives from a variety of fields at tech, and they'll share why they enjoy what they do. Participants also have a chance to directly ask speakers and recruiters questions and get a good understanding of why tech is a great place to work, as well as where your strengths, talents, and learning opportunities lie. Uh, so we've got uh, four students with us, and obviously you can see their names here. Um, maybe we'll we'll get uh, maybe we'll go in alphabetical order here, and, and maybe Brendan, do you want to uh, maybe introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Brendan. I started it, uh, in January, and this is actually my second co-op with Tech. I did it uh, a term in 2015. I did a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And went to work for a few years and decided to pursue software and now working on my master's in software and yeah doing a, doing a one-year call with tech in software great caitlin hello uh, my name is caitlin i have been working as a co-op um with tech since may of last year so just over a year um, and I have a couple months left, so that's been good. Um, as you can see, I'm a social responsibility co-op, which um, a lot of people don't really know what's entailed in that, but um, my discipline or my background is business um, and marketing. And then I have um, like a minor in social responsibility. So um, yeah, I get to work with the environment and social responsibility team and work on um, indigenous and community engagement would be my main area of focus. So um, yeah, pretty a, a lot of really great opportunities to work with the communities around South Valley as well as the Indigenous nations and um, to work with environmental assessments and, and lots of uh, varied opportunities that hopefully we can have a chance to talk about um, in the next little bit. Awesome. All right. Well, I pass it over to Eric. Do you want to do a quick intro? Yeah, hi, my name is Eric. I started back in January um, working as a Race 21 co-op at the uh, Fording River site in the Elk Valley. Uh, I currently am working as a project manager where I coordinate between the site assets as well as the Vancouver development and product owner teams working to bring initiatives to site that hit the bottom line value. Awesome. And then over to you, Aaron. Hi, I'm Erin. So I'm working on the AHS implementation project at Elkview in the Elk Valley. So I'm kind of working with data reporting and analytics because in the autonomous system, you get a lot of data. So figuring that out. Awesome. Great. I mean, maybe I'm a bit biased, but I think some pretty, pretty cool jobs. <laughs> <laughs> that you guys have all sort of found your way into. Um, so that's very exciting. So yeah, thanks. And we've got quite a variety here. So um, what I'll do, how about I check the chat first? I've got a pocket full of questions that I'd love for you guys to dive into as well. Um, but I just want to make sure that, um, sorry, my, there we go, uh, that we address everybody's questions just because it, it could be quite busy in the chat. Um, so first off, um, doo -doo 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 -doo, sorry, bear with me for one second. So, so people have asked some recruiting questions. I'll, I'll take those as we go. Yeah, I've answered uh, yeah. a couple of those, Stacy, just yeah. uh, in the chat. Sorry. So one was, read them. Okay. <laughs> and for those who can't access, for those who can't access the chat, maybe I should actually read out some of the answers I've given. So one question was about okay. uh, the students going to be searching for work for January 2022, and is it too early? Um, and I suggested, well, we will post for those in the uh, third week of September. Yeah, uh, so that's right. we we definitely will be hiring. Uh, yeah. So just uh, just a <laughs> FYI. Yeah. I'm not sure about the electrician, like the electrical side of it yet. Like we don't often know until about four months in advance to the start. So just before we put our postings up, we usually kind of confirm what the approvals are for the following term. So right now I'm just securing my approvals all for September, which is why I say I'm anticipating somewhere between 70 to 80 co-op positions because I have a, a likely about 70 just for coal alone. So it's going to be a busy term and we're just waiting for some of them from like race in different areas that'll likely come up. Um, so yeah, so there'll, there'll be quite a bit of recruitment in the next while, but usually I can only handle four months in advance because our numbers are quite huge. <laughs> 
I'm going to put Eric so, on the spot here, though. Sure. Um, I, I did answer one question. Uh, so the question was about race 21. Uh, and I noticed that the job posting says race X. Mm. Uh, is that the same program? And I, I sort of found that we're going through a branding change. But I don't know, Eric, do you have any uh, further insight about um, what's going on there? Um, yeah. So within race 21, there's definitely a branding change. At the same time, though, there's definitely some different domains of responsibility within race 21. So there is working as a race asset where you're working at a site a specific area or you're working with the development team, the product owners, operation, uh, excellence back in the Vancouver uh, head office. So I, I can't comment too much on the race X portion of it. However, within a race 21, there are various domains that you can work within, each having very different responsibilities, but yet working with every other domain with under the umbrella of race 21. Perfect. Yeah, I know. And I think I sort of joke about it, too, because obviously race 21 initially was created to be up until 2021 was sort of our first big technology push. Um, the plan is obviously to extend it beyond 21. Um, but uh, yeah, they're they're rebranding that title and what that's going to look like or if it's 2024 or what that. So that's uh, part, part coming down the line here pretty quick, too. So that sort of rebranding on that side. Um, great. So I think a great place for us to start anyway would be let's go around the horn to all four of you guys. I'd love for you to answer this question. And I know there may be some overlap, but uh, maybe we'll start with you, Aaron. If you could sort of tell me a little bit about so far, like you've been here a little while now, tell us a little bit about your favorite parts of the job. And then let's give it to them straight. What's the most challenging part of the job as well for you th thus far? Um, so for me, kind of coming from a mining engineering background i didn't have much coding experience i did first year coding you do in engineering but that was about it so coming to this position where it's a lot of data analytics and kind of figuring out how to code that and get that data has been super exciting for me it's definitely not like a typical mining engineering position but yeah. it's really something i was interested in and getting the chance to do that here was really great and it's really rewarding to kind of see where i started from quite you know beginner level to how much I've advanced my skills in that. Um, yeah, the biggest challenge, I guess, was in the beginning trying to figure it out, especially with uh, some of the COVID restrictions and stuff, uh, not being able to interact with many people and having on-site interactions limited, and they're still limited now. But yeah, definitely uh, learned some ways around it as I've been here <laughs> almost yeah. nine months. So. Yeah, gross. It's been that long already. That's crazy. Yeah. And I mean, you're definitely, like you said, um, you're definitely not your like traditional mining engineering role. Oftentimes, both you and Eric actually are, are not in your traditional mining engineering roles. But, um, you know, a lot of times most of our mining engineers come in as like short range planning, that side of the side of things. Um, and you've managed to get yourself into autonomous um, haulage, which is super exciting project. And then Eric on the race team. So, um, yeah. We're, we're definitely seeing a big shift though, even though traditionally we always had like short range planners as, as sort of incoming co-ops. Um, we're definitely seeing a bit of a shift in that more people are asking for a little bit of that technology understanding or like a little bit of coding knowledge because even in the traditional roles now we're seeing a lot more that implementation of technology and they want people to have a little bit more of a skill set in that area so um, it's great that you mentioned that because I think it's really good for people knowing hey they're coming to a company that's going through this kind of transformation they they likely would want to brush up on their skills in the technology space definitely <laughs> yeah Awesome. All right. Well, Eric, I've already brought you into it. So let's move over to you next. What is your most exciting or the best part of your job and what's the most challenging? Yeah, uh, I think for mine would have to be the communication and collaboration with so many different people. So for my role specifically, I'm having to communicate on a daily basis with the operators, the head operations, uh, general supervisors, superintendents. As the same time, though, also the race 21 personnel, so the developers and the product owners in the Vancouver office. And I have to act as kind of the bridge or the gap between all these different areas and really coordinate and create a viable product that's sustainable uh, for when I disappear, when I'm done with my co-op term. And that's a bit of a double edged sword as well, because the the not necessarily the dark side of it, but having to communicate with so many of those different stakeholders they have different knowledge backgrounds they have different um desires for what they're looking for they have different priorities and having to balance all that together into a 
comprehensive initiative that meets everybody's desires as well as needs is a bit is a, is a bit difficult, but at the same time, it's very rewarding. We're able to actually communicate with everybody on the same page and eventually succeed with initiative. Yeah, that's awesome. No, that is. I mean, the for such a large company, going through that change management is is definitely a huge challenge and and something we're tackling head on. But uh, there's always going to be some growing pains along the way, no doubt. <laughs> Especially in the role that you're in with that in between, right? Um, perfect. All right, Caitlin, over to you. Can you tell us a little bit about your the best parts of your job and the most challenging part? Yeah, um, maybe I'll start with the most challenging, you know, get that out of the way. But <laughs> um, so I actually came from experience working with nonprofits and um, my the last organization I worked with was very small. And so I would say something that was challenging was coming into such a big organization, kind of like Stacey and Eric were just talking about. And it's just um, navigating all of the approvals and systems and, and all of that, it was definitely challenging. But one of the reasons that I wanted to try working at tech and um, try for profit. And, um, you know, on the other hand of that, I have had really my personal team is quite small and have been really great support um, and advocates for me and in, in my learning. And so so that's been really great. And um, also kind of similar to Eric, I, I play a boundary role, as I'd call it. So um, part of my role is to talk to communities and Indigenous um, nations and anyone really external about what we're doing in tech internally. Um, and then also to listen to those uh, external communities and then bring that back into tech. And, and um, so we can make sure that we are um, we're looking at those things that are going to impact our communities and trying to um, make sure we mitigate them and then also to spread all of the benefit because there's a lot of benefit that comes from um, from tech as well and so um, that's I would say like building these relationships has been really rewarding for me and being part of those um, yeah relationships with our communities and um, that those actually have real life impact I think a lot of time coming from academia it's a lot of conceptual and so to come into a company and be able to actually be a person that's that's having impact on what happens in the community that I now live in um, has been has been really great. And just like tech has so many great opportunities to put you into um, situations that you wouldn't have the opportunity to otherwise. So being a part of like myself, I get to be part of this big project that we're trying to get permitted. And so I get to have um, uh, I get to try out like what what is involved in an environmental assessment, which wasn't on my radar when I when I came into my role. So a lot of things that just kind of push you out of your comfort zone or like what like Aaron and Eric were saying that maybe we weren't expecting as we came in, but have been super rewarding. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to mention, Caitlin, just is there any sort of areas that really were you know, that you never covered in school that were sort of surprising? So it sounds like that environmental assessment part was was probably a big piece for that. Hey. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's like a couple like we would mention it, but it's totally different being in it and mm -hmm. to get in all of the details and nuances and it's different when you're dealing with real people. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Caitlin. All right, Brendan, over to you. Um, you probably know the question by now, but <laughs> the, <laughs> <Yeah>. the, <laughs> the wins and the challenges <laughs> for yours. Yeah, so uh, I work on the data engineering teams. So we get data from the servers on site and in Calgary up to the cloud. And so I guess the, the biggest challenge I've found is understanding everything that's going on, which is pretty crucial to to doing everything properly. There's so many little little parts that all come together and. Uh, and it's quite different than any of the courses that I took in school, so lots of learning on the fly, which is really exciting. Um, and I guess that's one of the most exciting things too about this job so far in the last five months when I think about how much I've learned. It's pretty crazy to think about. Even just two weeks ago, I was talking with one of the data engineers and said, just think about how much you've learned in the last four months. Pretty, pretty cool to think about. So. Yeah, awesome. All right, uh, great. And then, um, OK, so I've got another question in the chat that's popped up and um, it's uh, just sort of double checking. I got it all here. Um, yeah, so then someone's asking about the autonomous systems in mining and um, 
are they in fact a success story to mine sites yet? And what's the main problems or challenges that uh, in order to implement new technologies efficiently? Well, I think we've talked a little bit about that. Obviously there's lots of challenges with um, shifting with towards technology and there's lots of change management associated with that. Did you, I guess, Masaki, do you want to mention it or maybe I could throw it over to Aaron. Do you want to talk? Speak to that one a little bit. Yeah, we'll get let's get our mining students talking about. We got Aaron and Eric <laughs> can jump in there. Uh, yeah, so obviously autonomous, that's my whole thing here. Um, you know, it's been going quite well at Elkview, and we started about February last year, and we're planning to be fully autonomous by about November. So that's a pretty good turnaround. Um, just kind of based on my experience, you know, some of the main issues is. I think people think autonomous and that it's all just it's the computers they'll do it all for us and like you know the people can just go along with their life but it's really just one part of the mining kind of ecosystem so you really need to um, get people on board with the idea and embrace it and know how to interact with it so I think that's kind of been the biggest challenge for us and maybe that some people weren't expecting um, as for the success part, I think there's not as many um, autonomous operations here in Canada, but Australia, like it's it's very big there, and you know many big successful mines have implemented it there. So, hey Aaron, can you yeah. give us numbers of of autonomous vehicles at, at Elkview, and and like planned and like current and planned? Yeah, so we plan to convert all the trucks to be autonomous. Uh, when I came in, I think it was about like six trucks. Right now, I believe we're at 24, and our fleet is 47 or 49. So, yeah. Big numbers. Oh, big yeah. things. <laughs> I didn't realize we were already up to 20, 20 odd. That's, that's pretty crazy. I had a chance to tour the autonomous pit um, a few months back, and yeah, it's it was funny going into it. I was like, oh gosh, there's a, you know, a 400 ton truck and there's no one driving it. That's terrifying. <laughs> and then once you go through and you realize that you understand the technology and just the, the next level of safety, like you can create these virtual berms and the trucks know they can't go past this area. And it's just, it was mind blowing for me to see. And then, then you go into the other pit, you're like, whoa, there's real people driving these trucks. Is this safe? Like, <laughs> so, you know, you're just thinking about how, how, how what a different shift in in mindset it is and it really is uh it's really cool to see the technologies and at work and and uh and yeah it's it's really interesting for sure so it's going to be a neat transition over the next several years for tech we also have our, our highland valley copper site sorry <laughs> that's transitioning over to autonomous at the same time here too so uh, they're a little bit further along i think in the process eric can you talk a bit about fording fording river site yeah, so so Fording River is currently in very, very basic evaluation for bringing autonomous vehicles to our side as well. However, we have different uh, parameters you have to meet that are different from maybe LQ where Aaron's working at. So with Fording being one of the most complex sites within the valley, we're running three pits. And because of that, you also have to look at kind of the viability of where you're going to be doing it, maybe for each pit, maybe for a specific haul road as well as with having the roads change so often with the pits changing as well. There's a lot of factors you have to uh, come into play and actually determine if it's gonna be a long-term viable solution. So while autonomous vehicles are great, you know, there's a lot of huge plus side to it. It's still very niche in that you have to decide where it's gonna fit. And if it does fit, how can you make that sustainable in the long-term? And I think LQ is doing a fantastic job with it. And I think Aaron has a crazy cool job as well doing it. I hope I get to go see it before I leave. But uh, Fording River, for sure, different challenges. But wherever you go, it's a very different climate, different environment to be working in. Yeah, is it right, Eric, that uh, Fording has a few different types of trucks too? So at Elkville, we have one consistent type of truck, whereas Fording, is it three or Three, at least three different types of trucks, eh? Uh, about about four different kinds of trucks, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so with that comes a whole bundle of other problems of issues. It's right. So surface level, yeah, we would love to have autonomous haul trucks, but going into it, there's a lot you have to evaluate beforehand. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks, you guys. Great. Um, someone's asked here about the interview process for co computing science. 
Um, and I can speak to it and then maybe I can throw it to you, Brendan. You can speak to a little bit about your experience going through it. Um, so yeah, we usually do a, a two-step process for um, computer engineers and computer science. So I would do the initial interview, I know for the coal business anyway, and then usually then we, we bring in a subject matter expert or the hiring manager for that particular role. And then they would do a secondary conversation and just to get a little bit more. So we don't necessarily do any whiteboarding and actually like any tests around the coding side of things at this point. Um, in race, they may do a little bit of that depending on the role. Um, but uh, but for Cole, we don't, but it, we would usually go through a little bit of ex just assessing your experience level through the interview process um, with the hiring manager. Brendan, do you want to speak to that a little bit more? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I had a, the first interview I had was with Stacy, and it wasn't technical, just more about what I hoped to get out of the co-op, if I would be a good fit. Uh, for the position and what sort of positions might be available uh, at the time. And then after that, I had an interview with my supervisor currently, and it wasn't uh, no whiteboarding questions or nothing super technical. Just talked about some of my past experiences and again, what I hope to get out of the position and just get to know each other a little bit, see if we'd be, work well together. Yeah, awesome. Great. Yeah, and I think race goes through, they may have, so I know for some of their new graduate positions, they definitely have some testing and I think they do the same with their co-ops. They might have some, just some basic questions around your coding experience, just so you, they have a, an idea about your knowledge base so they can support you through that. And then someone's asked about the interview process for electrical engineers as well. So, so similar, except for more often than not, but depending on the type of role you're going into, likely to be just the, the, one interview with either myself or someone from one of the other operations, depending on where the role is located. Um, if it's going to be within the digital systems group, often will because we have such a variety and we want to sort of make sure we find the right fit for people. Again, it might be a secondary, maybe half an hour to 40 minute chat with the hiring manager to sort of assess where you'd be the best fit from a technical standpoint. But if you're going to sort of like more of the maintenance side of things, then usually it's just an interview with myself. And then we'd, we'd go from there and make decisions from that. Awesome, all right. Um, I've got a bunch more questions, if you can bear with me, if no one else has any questions. If anyone has one that they wanna raise their hand, go ahead and, and please jump in. Um, but otherwise, it's a quiet bunch today. I'll, I'll keep things rolling. Um, cool, so I guess I'm kind of curious. So Caitlin, maybe we'll start this question with you. Why did you choose mining and industry? Like I know you mentioned you came from nonprofit. So why did you make the leap? What was sort of inspired you to, to come on board with tech? Um, yeah, so it, it's yeah very different from nonprofit. Um, one of the reasons I like co-ops is because you get to try it out um, and see. So it was a great opportunity to, my goal was to try for-profit sustainability. So focusing on those companies like tech who um, they're, they have money to put into research and development. And, um, you know, we put billions of dollars into water quality and, you know, nonprofits just don't have that, uh, those resources. Um, and so my main goal was to try something where like, I want to be able to have to make an, an impact and make a difference. And so um, just the way that our, our system is set up that that is with these big for profit companies. And so I wanted to try it out. And um, as far as mining, I, I wouldn't say I found mining as much as mining found me. Um, but the fact that there is a team, um, a social responsibility team within a mining company is very um, unique. And um, I think that that just the even the title of it really pulled me in. And then my experience with nonprofits and it just uh, gave me a lot of experience in stakeholder management. And, and that's you know a lot what what I do in my position um, now. And so yeah, I guess the thing is like for mining, especially the coal business unit, you know, we need steel to to do things the way that we're doing things now and as also as part of a low carbon future. Um, and so to be a part of a company who is trying their best to do that in the most responsible, most sustainable way um, is why I wanted to, to try it out. And um, so far, so good. I started with an eight month co-op and extended it to 16 months. So awesome. No, it does make you feel good about the company you work for when the kind of initiatives you see come through. Um, and our environmental group is growing so much. It's crazy. Like, um, 
looking back at sort of co-op that I've had in the past, like co-op hires, um, mining, mechanical, engineering were usually my biggest ones every term. And now I'm seeing the shift and those are still huge. Well, like you said, I have 70, I think that I'm trying to hire for September, um, but a big chunk of them are actually now environmental and you have people, students that are going into fish and aquatic sciences and like all these different areas it's so there's it's really some niche areas within the environmental group and then obviously on the social responsibility side that community engagement it's so neat to see um how we're so engaged with the communities around us and and you know at the end of the day we all want to feel good about the company we work for and so um the job that you do to, to really work with the communities makes such a big difference um great so yeah. so brett Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was going to say that in the environment, like, it's basically a research facility. Like, there's so many very passionate, very talented people. And yeah. it's, it's been really cool to even just get a base level information. I'm not a science background, but um, on all like the water quality and mm -hmm. um, fish and, and all that stuff. So that's been cool uh, to to just see their passion. You can you can even through a screen, yeah. <laughs> you, you can you can tell it's there. Yeah. For sure. I know. And I think what makes us unique, and I've said this before, is that uh, we all live and work in the communities surrounding these mines. So it's not like we're like fly in, fly out and we're not we don't have connection. Like I'm drinking water out of the tap here every single day. Um, so even though like the, the company has such a great value set in terms of um, protecting the areas, but every individual that works here also has that same value set. So it really aligns. And I think that just makes the world of difference in terms of the initiatives because it, it aligns with the values of the employees and we all sort of have a vested interest in protecting the environment here. So um, I think that makes it that much more successful. Awesome. And then Brendan, maybe I'll throw it over to you because I know obviously Eric and Aaron, I can see why they maybe chose mining. <laughs> but for you, Brendan, you know, there's other areas. Why did you choose mining? What, what brought you back to us after the first co-op experience you had? Um, I guess I like it because just it's I find it's an industry that's changing quite rapidly currently. Like as an example, in my co-op in 2015, when I wanted to look at, say, the info of a truck, I'd have to look at an enormous Excel table, which would take five minutes, maybe 10 to figure out some, something about it. And are now fast forward five, six years, I can I can look at these enormous tables with terabytes of data and create something in a few seconds, which is pretty cool to see just how much more efficient things have gotten. Yeah. And and that that can be applied to many other aspects across the business too. And then also I think within mining too, there's so many different paths you could take. And I feel like if with a career in mining, you're not going to end up doing the exact same thing your whole life, which is a great way to keep it interesting and and stay engaged throughout your career. Keep it fun. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. That's great. Perfect. Yeah, I know. I don't think often people going through digital systems and, you know, computer engineering, maybe their first thought in their head sometimes is it mining? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if we're necessarily uh, always seen as the most technologically advanced industry, but we're really getting there. And I, we sort of joke, you know, the, the running joke is that we're like a startup with a lot of money. Um, and so you, you can do some really cool stuff and really see the impact of the work that you're doing. Um, from the digital side of things, well, from all the jobs, but but certainly the digital space, um, it's it's not like you're just we're going through the motions. You really get to see the the fruits of your labor pretty quickly, which is kind of exciting. And to build on that, just to plug our our event next week for any programmers that's sort of interested, we our next campus coffee is on uh, data pipelining and security. And we've chosen these because a lot of students don't even know what data pipelining is, right? So uh, there's lots of different career paths to, to choose even in within a company like tech. Awesome. And while, Brendan, while you're you're talking, and I'll, I'll circle back to the other question as well, but um, someone's asked here, which programming languages does tech mostly use? Do you want to, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think our team mostly uses C Sharp, a bit of Python, and lots of SQL. Um, but I think depending on which team you're on, you could but, but many different languages are used. Um, a lot of front end developers using React and um, we have a lot of Java too. But I think there is really a, quite a bit of everything. Uh, yeah. Just depending which team you're on, it varies quite a bit. Just different tasks require different languages. Okay, yeah, for sure. Great. I know I, I've heard hiring managers also mention that if there's a language that you're more comfortable into, sometimes you'll have the opportunity to use um, so use that. Uh, Erica, can you comment a little bit on what you've seen from your side of things from programming languages? 
Yeah, uh, I think some of what Brendan was saying, it's very dependent on where you're working. So, for example, I've been working with Python, uh, SQL, uh, as well as also with Power BI reporting as well. I think that's a huge skill if you can bring that in already. I think definitely would touch upon that. But also um, React huge for the front end side of it. So for some of the apps that we're actually creating for on site, um, you're looking at the back end, the front end, uh, the integration of it. And so that touches upon a variety of languages, sure, with Java. Um, but again, dependent on where you're going to be working, it's very specific. So it's hard to comment on that like a general across tech business because tech business is so large and there's so many functioning business units within it. Yeah, for sure. Great. All right. Um, and Aaron, I don't know, Aaron, does that cover pretty much everything that you've seen along your, like I know you said you were learning coding a little bit since you've you've been with us? Yeah, I've been mainly working just with like SQL and Power BI as well, so. Okay, perfect, that's great. All right, and then Caitlin, someone's got a question here around social responsibility. Um, what does tech do to make sure that every employee is doing their part to contributing to social responsibility? So that's a pretty pretty uh, broad question for sure for you, but I guess, can you comment a little bit on any specific things that we've been doing within the communities? Or even with like employees, you've seen that they are doing to do their part in social responsibility? Yeah, so as Cece is kind of mentioning, there's a lot of encouragement to do things within your your own community. And so that is as like a you know private citizen, but um, tech is just such a big part of the Elk Valley that it kind of you know has that that spillover. But um, so we've recently did a survey and like you know like most of our employees are involved in in different um, like clubs, like different um, outdoor clubs or, or things like that. And I think just being a part of the communities really helps to, like Stacey was saying, you you want to make sure that where where you live is, is being taken care of. Um, and then also, of course, like the bigger corporate things, like um, just having the, the different, like, so you can look at tech.com, I can put a link in after, but um, like we have a sustainability report and so we have these pillars of sustainability and so they're kind of um, worked in throughout your, your work day and, and one of the things I would say we're working on um, is because um, a big focus is, for me is Indigenous engagement and so we work with the Tanaha who is um, the local Indigenous nation who holds rights and title in the valley and what we are trying to do is have things like cultural awareness sessions so that um, to a broader range of employees, just so people can understand, you know, what the communities need, what the Indigenous nations are um, are looking for from us. And so that that understanding um, is really vital. And then also um, just that we have like donation matching programs. So like if, if um, an employee wants to donate to like um, a nonprofit or a charity, then um, tech also puts in funds. I'm not sure exactly how it works. It's a little bit out of my scope, but, um, and then we have a ton of like community events that we'll plug for all of our employees, like different donation things. And, um, uh, you know, like we, we just donated a bunch of money to one of the local hospitals, things like that. Um, so it's, it really varies, but, but those are a couple of examples. And I think Eric has something to add. Yeah, I just want to add on to that. Um, because we are in the mining business, uh, a lot of our employees are working at site. So a lot of these mining sites. And because of that, a lot of us are living near site or living in these areas such as the Elk Valley. And I think because of that, there's a huge cultural shift in taking uh, responsibility and accountability for where we're living um, environmentally, socially. I think there's a great culture around all the tech sites and the communities around it. And I think on top of that, what tech's doing and with the Race 21 program as well with water management, with environmental, using our innovation and our technology to actually improve upon this and create a better environment for where we're operating speaks huge to our overall culture as well as our branding as well. And I mean, that's one of the large drivers why I decided to join tech is because you can see the tangible impacts that tech is making in the environment and social responsibility. Yeah, just to add on that, um, I just pasted in a link for those who can access it. But what got me excited was we got a uh, Ideas at Work fund. 
Uh, and it's basically $25 million that's set aside for people at tech who come up with a good idea that's going to you know, do things better. And, and, uh, and a lot of the projects have been focused on environment, sustainability, reducing our costs. Uh, and uh, yeah, anyway, so that's just one, one example that sort of stands up for me. Yeah, and as Eric was saying, like as my role in social responsibility, I am talking with so many different employees in different disciplines. So it is really integrated. Like the social responsibility team maybe, you know, ha like has some of these ideas and takes it to the communities, but a lot of it is just communicating what other employees throughout the organization are doing. And, and that integration is definitely vital for, for any success in environment or like sustainability and social responsibility. Awesome, that's great. Perfect. And, and you sort of mentioned a little bit about the community in terms of, I guess, outdoor lifestyle. And Masaki, I'm mindful. I know we're going to start the trivia here in a minute or so. Um, but I guess a quick comment from all you guys, because I know a big part of the draw to some of our sites is that we're based in some pretty spectacular locations. And obviously, I'm a bit biased. I live here as well. But part of the reason I moved here is for the lifestyle in addition to, to the job. So maybe for fun, let's do a little around the horn on what's your favorite thing about living in the Elk Valley or, or living in, in, uh, in where you live and, and what you do for fun. Maybe Eric, I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot to do in the valley. If you're outdoors, you're like me. Um, during the winter, I went skiing. I went uh, snowshoeing, uh, ice skating. I played hockey for the first time. I'm originally from Texas, so I don't play hockey. So that was uh, quite the experience. <laughs> Uh, in the summer, though, uh, hiking. Um, there's some cliff diving around here, uh, being safe, of course. Um, mountain biking. Uh, the, my, everything that you want to do outdoors in the mountains, you can do. And there's beautiful scenery to do it. So don't don't ever feel like there won't be enough to do in the valley because there always is. <laughs> How about you, Aaron? Thanks, Eric. Yeah, you know, getting up to most of that same stuff as well. But I would say. Just, I think a lot of those activities are things that I never would have considered myself doing, like cliff jumping or mountain biking. But I'm like, you know, I'm here. I'll try them out. So yeah, it's been exciting. That's awesome. How about you, Caitlin? Um, ditto, definitely. <laughs> I would say oh, there was a couple of, you know, like hiking, backpacking, um, climbing, all those things I like to do before. Um, and so I was excited about that. But then being here, like just bought a mountain bike. So I've been getting getting on the trails. So that's really great. And one of the things I really love, I live in Fernie um, in particular. And one of the things I really love is I don't have to, like I, before I was in Lethbridge and so you have to, you're close, but you have to drive like at least an hour to the mountains where in Fernie or in anywhere in the Elk Valley, it's like, I can do it after work. And I have time because the mountain is right there. <laughs> so it's, you're, you're really, you're really in it. Yeah, I sort of joke in the winter that I'm like the five run wonder because I'm we're so close to the ski hill that I'm like, oh, I could just go up and ski five runs, six runs, and then come home, and I still have a full day. So it's uh, we're pretty spoiled that way. I, I I go to other communities, I'm like, oh, there's ski hills so far away, <laughs> but spoiled. <laughs> and so this is just a few comments of some students that um, from their survey when they left us just about uh, their experience and and how much they enjoyed it. And I think the most common thing we hear from people is I can't how much responsibility I was given at the co-op with, with tech and I think even just the stories that the students have given you today have really attested to that like they're taking on some pretty huge high level projects and for us co-op is a great opportunity for us to build our talent pools for future opportunities whether like Brendan you come back for a second co-op or or potentially the others or hopefully everybody will come back for a full-time position and, and that's the whole goal for tech as a for co-op is really creating that talent pool for pe people to try us out get some great experience experience so that you could come back and potentially work long term so um so yeah people are getting great experience they're loving what they're getting to learn while they're with us and and hopefully um we'll see them come back again at some point is sort of the the goal um yeah and in terms of yeah like i mentioned our postings are up on the website right now and if that's for our september term so like i mentioned every four months we'll be recruiting for that upcoming term so um then once january comes around we'll be recruiting i'm um, sorry 
when September comes around, we'll be recruiting for January, that sort of thing. So that's sort of how it works for us. So you can keep it on the website as well as at your, your campus um, co-op offices if you're in a co-op program. Um, if you're in a traditional program and you can take an extended period of time off, we also do hire traditional students as well, as long as they're able to do longer than four months. Most of our co-op positions are at least eight months or longer in duration. Any questions that have popped up, Masaki, that I need to address? Yeah, um, so uh, Braden has thought, is asking about, uh, about our environmental co-ops. So we got a lot of, you know, our, a lot of environmental positions, mm -hmm. and uh, I just want to know what these positions mostly focus on. Um, he's particularly interested in wetlands and riparian areas. Um, yeah, any? Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Then, some of the work we have with our biodiversity group um, definitely does a little bit with with birds and riparian areas. Um, and then we do have a few like on wildlife tracking as well. So like with um, you know, like any area, like we have like some co uh, wildlife corridors that come to this area. So we do have people that track on the wildlife side and then obviously fish um, as well. And uh, so, yeah, there's there's lots going on. So I guess it, there's quite a variety and every term it does change depending on what we've hired the previous term because usually it's eight month in duration or so. So um, this term coming up, I know we're seeing a lot around um, aquatic and water treatment. Um, there's a few different areas there. So yeah, so I guess it, it does vary. So you have to keep an eye out for it. I, our posting tends to be fairly general, but if you are, are interested in the environmental side of things, I would suggest putting your name in the hat and then we would um, we would definitely talk to you about the specific roles once you're in the conversation because otherwise I'd have to put up like 14 different <laughs> postings and it could get super complicated because people would apply to 14 different roles. So we try and just make a general posting that then we can sort of address each individual role once we're in the conversation. Thanks for that. Yeah, no worries. All right. All right. And someone's asked about yep. four months and I think I talked about that, that yep. more often than not we go to eight months um, and then those postings will come up in September. There's a question about uh, computer science co-op positions located in Vancouver, um, mm -hmm. and and uh, are there sorry are there positions that are located in Vancouver? Are students expected to work from home in January 2022? Any insight there? Yeah, from what I understand, I mean, again, it's hard for me to predict exactly what we're going to have in January, but I suspect we will certainly have some for the coal business unit, uh, for race in Vancouver or in the Vancouver office. We we could potentially have some. Um, again, you might have to wait till September to really put your name in the hat once we have those postings up and those positions confirmed. Um, likely you will be working in an office in January 2022. So um, like Brendan say, for example, is working from home this term, but um, a lot of that has been as a result of COVID and we're trying to keep as many people off site and out of the offices as we possibly can. So some people have been working a good chunk of their time remotely during COVID or, or all of their experience has been remote depending on the role that they're in. Um, so for, for, but I suspect by January, uh, I, I, I'm hoping <laughs> at this point that we're going to be at the tail end of this pandemic and, and we'll be able to move transition back into offices. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's hard to say at this point, I guess we'll be at it. It's, uh, but I, I suspect we'll be mainly in offices at that point. Perfect. I think we managed to get through all of the questions. I see Caitlin made a comment there. Congratulations, Caitlin, potentially. That's, that's great to hear you're having conversations about a full-time role. And it is true. Um, I, I have a picture of 10 co-op students in the Vancouver head office uh, with uh, the CEO uh, that I like to show because uh, seven of them have been hard working full-time. And that was just two years ago in those images, they're co-op students. So we do use the co-op program to, to build our full-time um, team. So um, yeah. Definitely encourage students to give us a try. And then hopefully through today's campus coffee, you, you've got a better sense of what it's like to work here and potentially more interested. Um, oh, there's another question from Fadil. Maybe we'll do this as the last question and, and, uh, and then <laughs> okay. shut her down. There's two. So I just to give um, Jasleen, I think, uh, has asked about computer science for the fall. We did just put a posting up. Literally, I think it's probably just popping up on the website today. So if you t visit uh, the tech.com, uh, website, you should see that uh, digital systems posting up and it is encompassing at least 14 different roles. So bear with me. I know there's a lot of little detail in there, but um, those are posted now. We've just got those confirmed um, at the end of last week. So those will be up. And then for interviews for the upcoming September, we should be starting interviews. Uh, we'll probably start to dabble this week and then into next week we'll really start. And then it'll continue through the next, well, the next month essentially. So I would imagine over the next few weeks, we should make some calls over the, for chemical process and all the other disciplines as well. I think that's all of them, hey?
Yeah, well, thank you everybody for attending. Um, hopefully you learned something new. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. All right, everybody, stay safe. Bye.